In fashion, shoulders are always about two things, power and seduction. The clothed shoulder is about power, and the bare shoulder is about seduction. But like anything in fashion, those single categories can be expounded out into a wide range of emotional subcategories. Bare shoulders are all about seduction, but that can be expounded out into looking sultry, domineering, wistful, vulnerable, smoldering, helpless, trapped, playful, delicate, fragile, ethereal, romantic, and even fierce. And power certainly doesn't have a single note either. When we look closely, power can be elaborated into chaos, subversion, speaking softly while carrying a big stick, defeat, generational wealth, playfulness somehow, witchcraft, intimidation, discipline, futurism, and defiance in the face of certain doom. If you're into fashion design, this may be somewhat obvious to you, but what might be less obvious is that women's shoulders specifically ended up saving fashion design more broadly. We have an enormous amount of stuff to cover in this episode and we're gonna have to move really quickly to get through all of it. So if you're not already, uh, buckle the in. Also, hi, if you're new here, my name is Bliss. I'm a full-time professional fashion critic. Here we cover the references, storytelling, and artfulness of designer fashion. And if that's what you like, you should 6,000% subscribe. And if you're a regular here, if you really like this content a lot, you should definitely join the Patreon. When you do that, you get exclusive episodes, you get episodes early, and you also get to join my private Discord server where there's lots of really intense, hectic, chaotic stuff going on. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody's super nice and welcoming and super knowledgeable. It's like the best fashion place on the internet. It's wonderful. Link is down in the description. Shoulder time. For a long time, shoulders in fashion design could be roughly divided up into two categories, angular and uh, sort of rounded and uh, frilly. Yeah, guess who got the angular ones? Guys did. Gross. Yes, folks, for many hundreds of years, we were baking gender roles into our shoulders. Men had shoulders that made them look capable and strong. And I'm guessing that the idea there was something like, okay, if things get really bad here, I can always wrestle my way out of this problem with my big old shoulders. We'll need to briefly start with classical tailoring here because that'll at least give us a foundation for men's shoulders in the modern era so we can see how women's shoulders came in to disrupt and ultimately save shoulder design. So of course, when we're talking about classical tailoring we're referring to the most boring category in fashion suits I promise to make this quick the French shoulder in classical tailoring is mega structured and can sometimes have a bit of a curve to it where the outside of the shoulder seam is propped up using rope this is called la cigarette and it is distinctive for classical tailors like Comps de Luca and one of my personal favorites Schifanelli. The British shoulder is much softer, but still structured. The rope is still there, it's still visible, but the whole effect is meant to be much quieter. When most non-fashion people think of a suit, usually the thing that pops into their head is a English style tailored suit. This is a style that's represented by pretty much all the Savile Row tailors, uh, places like Anderson and Shepard and Benson and Clegg. Is it Clegg? Yeah. Just a lot of white guy names. It's a real smooth tailored shoulder, isn't it? In it. In it. I'm so sorry if you're English. I just, it's so hard for me not to picture places like this being like, Lollipop's alive! Traffic was terrible! Let me hang up me at, and then I'll get to work here at Anderson and Shepherd. The Italian style of shoulder, this gets slightly less structured and you start to see these tiny pleats that are called shearling on the outside of the shoulder seam. And then you get all the way down to the unstructured shoulder, which is exactly what it sounds like. It gets way more complicated. There are a million variations, but those are the basics. Okay, okay, okay. So our story really starts today with the birth of the power shoulder for women. And it's crucial that we understand what the women's power shoulder actually meant for fashion. It was women taking the second most masculine hallmark of fashion and asserting dominance in it. The most masculine hallmark, by the way, was, was pants. The history of the women's power shoulder, like most of history, is really tough to pin down in an exacting way, but if we have to put a start to it, there were a lot of women who were joining the workforce for the first time in the 1930s, and some of those women were wearing Marcel Rochas's power shoulder. OG Elsa Scaparelli also was putting men's shoulders on women's dresses around the same time, which actually brings up a really interesting point that it tends to follow that during bad economic times, women's shoulders do tend to get more angular. 
Considering that everyone was recovering from the Great Depression, that does make sense. Push us a decade into the future and you have Christian Dior introducing his legendary bar jacket in his spring 1947 collection. This is a problematic addition to this list for two separate reasons. One, there were a lot of women at the time who had a problem with Christian Dior's new look silhouette in the first place. They thought that the kind of waspy waist and the cute little skirt to go with it did not really help women a lot in their new role in society. Women wanted to be seen as capable both in their day-to-day -day lives and in their careers, and this was not particularly helpful. Problematic thing number two is that it is rumored that the shoulder pads that are in this look in the first place were done at the last minute because the house model, the woman here, her name was uh, Tanya, who was very, very skinny, uh, they got her shoulder pads so that she would look more voluptuous. Not the most empowering story necessarily, but it's baby steps. We're going to keep moving. Later on, this idea of women having capable, powerful looking shoulders was reinforced again by Yves Saint Laurent in the legendary Le Smoking photo shoot in 1975. But really, these are all just little spread out pieces. The, the real story of this gets started when power shoulders really took over in the 1980s. Women were enjoying the biggest surge in the workforce that they had ever had in history during that time. The 1980s, 80s were the real shoulder decade in women's fashion and that was probably because there was a recession in the early 80s that was the worst recession in American history since the Great Depression. So shoulders were getting bigger, tons of designers were participating in this cultural shift but we're going to focus on two for the moment, Giorgio Armani and Thierry Mugler. Giorgio Armani was experimenting with women's suits that featured shoulder pads earlier than the 1980s, but he really captured the cultural zeitgeist during that decade. He's here in this episode as a way to show that a major, world-renowned, household name fashion designer had taken a major hallmark of menswear, added it to menswear, and hit Command V for 20 straight seasons in the 1980s. The collections were different, but damn it, those shoulders were there every time. Moving into designer number two, Terry Mugler used the power shoulder to subvert male expectations. Okay, but why is the hyper-feminine, maximalist, fantasy-creating, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular. Why is that designer adding a men's shoulder for women? The idea here is that Terry Mugler is dressing women for themselves, for a fantasy where they can be taken seriously by men but still feel sexy. The outcome of that is that Mugler's power shoulder ends up subverting male expectation. We're emphasizing these two designers in particular because they highlight how women's power shoulders were able to lift shoulder design away from the jaws of death, or at least the jaws of stagnation. I have some very spicy hot takes coming up here, so I really want to know what everyone has to say about this. Menswear, when you take it in as a whole, doesn't really like change. I mean, really, there's only three things that menswear has always really liked. Military-inspired designs, suits, and workwear. And I like all three of those categories, they're great, but at a certain point, there's only so many ways that you can arrange those pieces before you're just doing the same thing over and over again. But the shoulder was the major catalyst that started blurring the lines between menswear and women's wear. This is how. When you introduce something as distinctly masculine as the power shoulder into women's wear, you start to ask the question, not, not even out loud, it just starts to imply the question, what could women's wear become? I mean, women's fashion has just always been so obsessive about this idea of being pretty and being sexy and being dainty and being perfect that there was just very little room for a wide range of emotional expression. Like, can you imagine if movies had the same hangups that women's fashion design had? Like, if, if the whole medium of film had to just be about being pretty and dainty and perfect? There are certainly great movies that are just pretty and perfect, and there are definitely, definitely some incredible runway shows that are just about being pretty and perfect. But the medium needs to be about more than just that. Women's power shoulders were the catalyst for that evolution process to start building. So once those floodgates had opened for women's wear design, it wasn't just about what shoulders women could have anymore. It started opening up to everything else too. I mean, suddenly we had sophisticated conceptual women's wear design and it was somewhat mainstream. 
And okay, we're now to the fun part of the video where we get to just bounce around and talk about a bunch of really fun shoulders. Let's go! Martin Margella came busting into fashion, bringing a shoulder for women that's generally referred to as the Margella cigarette shoulder, which you can tell is somewhat inspired by the cigarette of classical tailoring, but it takes it to a, uh, <laughs> a much more extreme place. This shoulder kind of hits us with a bump around the midway point, which I imagine is meant to imitate the little bump that the clavicle bone has on everyone's natural shoulder. Like you can feel it on yourself. It's, it's usually a, a right around there. Some people it's like really, really dominant. Other people it's a little bit more hidden, but the clavicle does have this kind of like curved bump to it right there. But this makes a lot of sense because Margiela kind of made his career highlighting overlooked but beautiful things. And maybe he saw this evolution of the women's power shoulder and kind of thought back to a time when women's shoulders were only really being used in a bare-shouldered kind of way. Maybe he missed some of that natural beauty and wanted to bring that into a more modern look of a structured shoulder. And what's interesting about this symbolically is that despite this direct reference to a naked shoulder, Margiela's clothes were often not sexy at all. And when they were, it was a very real life kind of sexiness. Not the done up perfection that we often find on runways, but more of a long time monogamous couple that's very comfortable with each other kind of sexy. This bare shoulder reference in the context of a business suit provokes a lot of questions about femininity, women's role in the 1990s, and it kind of dares the viewer to ask those questions directly to the woman wearing this powerhouse of an outfit. All right, hang on. Let's talk about Alexander McQueen! Lee McQueen's shoulders were terrifying. The first thing that always comes to my mind is his collection, It's a Jungle Out There, with the Thompson's gazelle horns breaking through the leather skin of the jacket. His inspiration for this collection was zoomed in National Geographic photos of gazelles being eaten. And in that way, this shoulder is either about the defiance of the gazelle in the face of death, or the representation of maybe its final attempt to impale its predator. These conversations, like all of McQueen's conversations, are thought-provoking, they're difficult, and they're <laughs> really scandalous. He seemingly couldn't release a single season of clothes without being accused of something. But a fashion designer occupying that space of talking about something that wasn't simply pretty, wasn't just fun, cute, flirty, that space would not have been as widely accepted if the lines between women's wear and men's wear hadn't been blurred. But on the very feminine front, this conical shoulder neckline thing, this is from spring 2007 Saraband, is also crazy because it's a show inspired by 19th century silhouettes, but also in the Spencer jackets and tails, it becomes a harmonious blend of masculine and feminine tailoring. And I mean, hey, if we're looking at the way that shoulders sort of opened up the conceptual and symbolic frameworks for women's wear design generally, there is no example better than Rei Kawakubo at Comme de Gar Song. There is not enough time in the world for me to break down what conceptually is going on in these shows, but I mean, for the shoulder to be taken from a place of only being frilly or only being bare and then moving to a place of being structured and then asking the question, well, what else can we introduce in women's wear? And then for us to move into this place, that is just leaps and bounds happening so quickly in fashion design. If you are looking for crazy shoulder design, truly, uh, look, look no further than Grandma Ray. And right now, here in the present, we are going through one of the most vibrant shoulder periods ever because of the god Rick Owens. And instead of me trying to interpret all of these out loud to you here, which I actually did a couple of weeks ago in an episode where we did a very deep dive on his most recent women's wear collection, you should definitely watch that episode. I am super proud of it. I am just going to let Rick explain his own work. I'm just going to read some quotes from him. The interviewer asks, quote, you started making coats with enormous shoulders a few seasons ago, and they've just kept getting bigger. They're a signature now. How have you continued to evolve their shape and volume? Do you emphasize different aspects of the outerwear depending on your mood? End quote. Rick replies, The world can be cluttered and sloppy. Somber and imposing tailoring is a rest for my eye. A sense of considered restraint and formality with a nod to the grotesque. He also has this other quote that's incredible where Rick says, haven't we had enough comfort dressing in the last decade? If we're gonna go down, I'm going down in heels and shoulder pads, not some cozy sweatsuit. I love that. 
And I really, really want to emphasize here that I am not attempting to reinforce a hegemony. I do not want there to be any confusion that I am saying that, oh, women's wear design was really bad until it became more like men's wear and then it became really great. No. But what I am saying is that women's and men's fashion design were distinct and separate. By merging those two pools together, by mixing the pieces a bit, the design was better off. And you'll notice women's design did not, and still does not, copy men's design. It's so much better than that. Women's fashion design borrowed key pieces from men's design, and then they developed their own grammar for it. It's not just take men's clothes and slap them on women. The designs evolved and they took their own shape on women. If you're a fashion designer, I really hope that you're taking notes here. We busted through a lot of design barriers when designers realized that they could do this. And hey, I mean, it goes the other way too. Like now we're finally in a period where menswear is starting to do the same thing. Taking key pieces from women's wear design, borrowing it, and it's becoming mainstream in fashion design now. Finally. Armani is a really great example of that. To quote from the New York Times, at the end of the 1970s, Armani altered his style dramatically. Taking his design cues from Hollywood costumes of the 1930s and 40s, he widened the lapels of his suits and extended and padded the shoulders. He also lowered the gorge, the broadest point of the lapel, from just beneath the shoulders to mid-breast, creating the look that would later evolve into the wedge-shaped power suit. This second sartorial innovation endowed men with a broad-shouldered, slim-hipped glamour. Another really great example is Bianca Saunders, who is one of just a few women who designs exclusively for menswear. We are in great hands with Miss Saunders. She does a lot of work doing very simple, no-nonsense draping for menswear. And one of the brilliant things that's come out of that is this incredible shoulder design. As with both examples, there's no copying here from men's to women's or women's to men's. It's taking key pieces from each other and then planting that idea in the ground and letting it grow in its own way organically. The designers are taking a concept that they're not used to and they're being honest with it and developing their own voice. Okay, listen, 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 listen. Go join my motherfucking Patreon right now, <laughs> please. You have no idea what you are missing out on by not being on that Discord server. I don't even care if you don't use Discord. Like, it is worth you downloading a new app and learning how to use a new social media app so that you can get more benefit out of it. I mean, really, when you get home from work and you are tired, would you rather sit there and watch 90 minutes of reels that you're gonna forget about immediately, or would you rather go and talk with fashion professionals and fashion heads that are super knowledgeable and learn and grow with everybody. No contest. We even have a student tier that's super cheap for people who can't afford to give a whole lot. But honestly, the Patreon is what makes this channel run. It's well worth your time. You get exclusive episodes, early episodes, but really that Discord is the huge, huge key point that is going to make this worth your while. I love you all a ton. I mean it. Go follow me on Instagram. Do all the stuff. See you next week.